Now, are you ready to hear God's Word? No, no, no. Are you really ready to hear God's Word? Would you stand with me? There was a very popular movie several years ago. I'm sure many of you saw it. It involved a man who had to make a choice. He had to choose between the physical, visible realm that he knew and the invisible realm that he did not know. And he made the choice when he understood that the invisible realm was actually controlling everything in the physical and visible realm that he lived in, the realm that he was accustomed to. The movie I'm talking about is Matrix, and Thomas Anderson had to make a decision because he finally came to the revelation where the real world actually was. How does that apply to us? Well, similarly, for us, There are two worlds. There is the physical world that we live in, and then there is this world behind the world that we live in. And so, have you, as a believer, as a Christian, have you learned that everything visible and physical is controlled by something invisible and spiritual? Have you actually learned that everything that happens to you is not by accident? Therefore, if you really want change in the realm that you know, you have to learn how to draw from the invisible spiritual realm that you do not see. Because everything that's visible and everything that's physical is controlled by the invisible and spiritual world. Now, the Bible says we are in a war. We are constantly in battles. And the war that we are in is spiritual. It is the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. But unless you know how to access your spiritual resources, which in our case would be the armor of God that God has given to us to equip us, so that we can fight in this world against the worlds that we cannot see, then we will lose battle after battle after battle. You don't have a choice of whether or not you are in the war. There is no ability to sign a peace treaty. But know that God has called you to victory. He's called you to be like Thomas Anderson. He's called you to be the one through whom God demonstrates his power from up there. But when executed down here, oh God, it shows us that there is much greater authority and power whatever you are facing right now down here. And so guess what, church? You are the only one that can give yourself victory in this life. If you learn, and I condition it, if you learn to use the equipment that's necessary to win each battle, this is your right. This is your calling. Having said that, go to a very, very familiar text in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 18. And I'm sure they will put it on the screen. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And so Paul says, I'll tell you how to be strong. I will tell you how to be mighty in God. How, Paul? Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I looked up the word wiles. It simply means strategies to manipulate someone to do what they want. And so Satan is constantly throwing strategies at you to try to manipulate you to do what he wants you to do. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but number one, against principalities, number two, against powers, number three, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, 
And number four, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where are these powers? In the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now please hear this. Having girded your waist with truth. And so you're talking about a belt, the belt of truth, number one. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, number two. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, number three. Above all, taking the shield of faith, number four, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, number four, and the sword of the Spirit, number five which is the Word of God. And then lastly, I think I, there's seven in all. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in spirit. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So I gave a number twice. So there are seven very specific, distinct weapons, armor, the arsenal that God has given us. And if you do not understand how to use this arsenal or how to put on this arsenal, then you are going to have a major, major problem in life because hell will beat you down. Having said that, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the path to victory. The path to victory. Turn to someone, look them in the eye, and say, do you know that God's called you to victory? Do you understand that this is our season of victory? It's one of the six words. But we are supposed to always be victorious. We are to be more than conquerors. And we're in a battle. You can't avoid the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. So what is the path to victory? Let us pray. Father, bless your word. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive the good seed. For we ask it in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. May be seated. To you who are listening by social media, I pray that you get pen and paper and write some of these important principles. Paul, in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, has said something that's extraordinary. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do fight against principalities and against powers and against the world forces of this darkness that's located in heavenly places. And wickedness. Paul has made it extremely clear that this is your problem. Whether you want to accept it or not, this is what affects you in this world more than anything else from a negative standpoint. This is your real problem. And that when you look at your circumstances, when you look at your crisis, when you look at adversaries, when you look at relationships that have gone awry, or you have attacks or tests or trials, Paul wants you to understand something. None of those things that you're going through that you consider as major issues or problems, none of them emanate from this physical world. They are not as they seem to be when you look at them on the surface. They do not emanate from a physical sphere. I'm talking about the sphere of flesh and blood, the physical realm. Paul says distinctly, clearly, he wants you to understand that the problems you face, the circumstances that are taking place, the adversaries, the problems in relationship, your problems in finances, whatever they might be, your problems in relation, every problem that you have emanates from a spiritual source. Do you really believe that? More importantly, do you understand that? 
And he is, of course, not suggesting that the physical is not real. No, the physical that you're seeing happen is real. But what he is actually saying is this. The real physical expressions that you're seeing are expressions of this warfare. They are expressions of the conflict. They are expressions of the battle. And they are expressions of the struggles in your life that emanate, that come from a spiritual source. And if you're going to win the spiritual victory that's causing the physical or the financial or the emotional or the relational problems, whatever it is that you are dealing with in this world that you live in, whatever they might be, he said, get this, the first thing you have to start with is truth. Wow, that's a revelation. And I need to suggest to you that every weapon that he gives us is in a specific order. And you have to start and go according to the order. And so he says, if you're going to win the issues that are in your life, the adversaries, the circumstances, the problems, the crisis, whatever you want to label it as, you have to start with truth. Truth is God's view of the matter. You may want to write that down. Truth is God's view of the matter. Truth is God based knowledge. This is what you must always start with in every battle, truth. The reason you have to start with truth is because Satan is, without exception, a liar. <laughs> so he feeds on lies, deceptions. He feeds on incorrect information. His whole program is based on making you think the lie is the truth. And if he can get you believing the lie is the truth so that he can have you to operate on the lie and not the truth, you just gave him an open invitation into your world to manipulate you however he desires. If he can make you believe that the lie is the truth, wow, he feeds on the lie. So God says to deal with him and these different levels of demonic authority, you have to begin by wearing the belt of truth. That is, you have to ascertain God's view on the matter. Now, you may not be aware of that, but that's going to be a problem when you try to buckle this belt because you will not always like the truth, you will not always want the truth, and you will not always be willing to accept the truth because God does not see things like you see things. God sees things always from a spiritual perspective. You many times see things from a physical perspective. But there's something you have to learn about divine truth. The truth is the truth. When you want it or when you don't want it, whether you like it or you don't like it, whether you hate it, hmm, whether you will accept it or whether you will reject it, the truth is always the truth. Because if it's predicated on God-based knowledge, how God views a matter, then that is God's perspective. That is God's view. And that's what makes it the truth, irrespective of your perspective concerning it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so the belt of truth is not always something that's easy to buckle up because we don't think like God. We don't act like God. We don't comprehend spiritual things like he does. So you have to say to yourself, this is how God thinks, and this is what God says, and therefore this is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God on this particular issue that is happening in my life. So the first thing you have to do is put on the belt of truth. Are you with me? Are you with me? 
then God says, now we have to go to the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is actually your response to the truth. Uh, it's when you correlate your standards based on the designation that God has given the truth and my operating in light of his standard. In other words, it's simply my standards becoming his standards. It's my coming to alignment. And then when I come into alignment with God, I'm operating rightly or I'm operating righteously or I have right standing with God because I'm in alignment with God. You do understand the heart is the core of the center of your being. And so the author, Paul, is saying that this is the centerpiece of your being. It's aligning yourself with the truth of righteousness because the heart filters through the rest of you. The heart is the pump that sends life to the rest of you. Life is in your spirit. So when the heart or when your core pumps righteousness because of the standard to the rest of you, it allows the rest of you to come into alignment, not just your spirit, but your soul as well as your body. Now, when you respond righteously and put on the breastplate of righteousness, you're coming into alignment with the truth. You're accepting the truth. You're protecting that which feeds you. So the next thing that you have to put on, and I love this, you have to put on your shoes. And he says the shoes are the gospel. Now the gospel, we all know it, the gospel, it's the good news of Jesus Christ. But he says you have to put on the gospel of peace. Not the gospel of the kingdom, but the gospel of peace which is definitely in the kingdom because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And so, one of the ways that God is confirming that you are doing what you should be doing in the battle that you're fighting is that now that you have put on the belt of truth, you're seeing this thing from God's perspective, you accept it, you have then gotten in right standing, you're in alignment God says, guess what? You are going to walk in peace. In other words, there's going to be a calm and a tranquility that literally takes over that you will experience inside of you as you're going through whatever. It will be over your entire life. Write it down. Peace is calmness. Peace is tranquility. Peace is very, very different from joy. Peace is when in spite of the chaos that is all around you, there is a calm inside of you. How is that possible? God is confirming to you that you have put on the belt of truth, that you have responded in right standing by aligning yourself to his standard, the truth, and the result is he is going to allow you to experience peace, a peace that passes or surpasses understanding. Why? Because Thessalonians says, may the God of peace sanctify you in your spirit, soul, and body. What does that mean? So God wants to bring peace as you're being transformed. God wants you to experience something that others can never experience. It doesn't make sense to have all hell break loose in your life and you to walk around calm and tranquil, in charge and in large. God wants to bring peace. Having aligned your life rightly based on truth, you are now being transformed and sanctified, meaning set apart by God himself. So, it starts with your spirit because that's the God part of you. And then to your spirit, it goes to your soul. That's your personality of your mind, will, and emotions. And then from your soul, it goes to your body. That's the environmental part. That is your relating to the physical world. So, when God, when God can literally, in a battle, get your spirit to affect your soul and your soul to affect your body, the result is peace, sweet peace. I have the counselor of peace living inside of me. 
I don't see what you see in the situation. All hell may be breaking loose, but there is a peace because I've learned the truth on what's taking place in my life, and I've aligned myself righteously to God's perspective and God's knowledge on the matter. The result is, how many have ever experienced just the peace that surpasses understanding? I'll never forget, I was going to have open heart surgery to have a valve replaced because I was only born with two valves in a, in a heart that was supposed to have three. And so it was causing major problems, and God told me to get operated on. And it didn't happen the first day. It didn't happen the second day. I was there all day. Everybody came out the first day. No one came the second day. And uh, they, early in the morning, because the doctor was so famous, rushed me down into the operating room, just took me from my bedroom to the operating room, and it was cold. And for two hours, I was awake because we were waiting on the doctor to be flown in. And I heard them talking about how they were going to use this to prop open my chest. And they were, I could see what they were picking up. We'll use this one. We'll take this saw and we'll do this. And I'm listening to all this. And you would think I would be horrified. And I just laid there. Peace. Peace. It did not affect. I listened to them for two hours, and there was a peace that came over me that I could not explain because I came into God's perspective. I came into the truth that he wanted this fixed, and this is how I was to fix it. And how many know that God uses doctors for healing? And he told me that's what I was supposed to do. Many times he just causes me to reach up and take what he's provided, the healing that is for me. So, the Bible says if he gives you a peace that surpasses understanding, it simply means that in the situation that you are in right now, how many have a situation? Anybody here that doesn't have a situation? See, I can't, I can't fathom that there's anyone here that doesn't have some sort of problem or circumstance or situation because the devil attacks us daily. We are in a war, and there is no uh, a peace treaty in this war. We are in battle every day of our life. Can someone say amen to that? So in the situation that I'm in right now where I am not supposed to be at rest, I am in a situation where instead of tossing and turning and all night in the situation and I should come to the place that I have a nervous breakdown or lose my mind, but even though all of my circumstances haven't changed, my situation hasn't reversed yet, I am still at peace and I'm chilling. I'm cool, and I'm still okay with all the chaos surrounding me because my alignment has been secured. Give God a praise for that. Now, you have to understand that you have to follow, again, the order, the use of the armor that God has given to you. He says, first, the belt of truth, then the breastplate of righteousness, then the shoes. That means that I am walking, I am constantly moving forward in the steps that God would have me to take because I don't know about you, but God orders my steps. My steps are ordered of the Lord. And when I'm walking in the steps he has ordered, there is the peace, the peace, the peace, the peace that surpasses understanding. And then he says, you have to take up the shield of faith. In fact, he says, above all, take up the shield of faith. Now, I want to make this simple. I want you to remember that faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Did you get that? Faith is acting like it is so, even if it is not so in your world, in order that it might be so simply because God said so. 
You want me to say that again? (laughs) Faith is acting like it's so, even when it's not so in your world, in order that it might be so simply because God said so. God is not a man that he can lie. So hear this. Faith is not tied first and foremost to your feelings. Faith is never dependent upon your feelings. Faith is always tied to your function. You may want to write that down. You see, you can feel full of faith and be totally faithless. You can have no feelings of faith and be full of faith because faith is actually measured by your feet. Probably never heard that. It's measured by the level of peace. It is not ever measured by your feelings. It is measured by life, not by lips. What he wants you to know is that your faith is governed by the decision that you made, not by the emotion that you had. Oh, God, I'm, I'm speaking and teaching better than you're responding. What does that mean? I can hear a great sermon on faith and feel all faithish. I know that's not a word, but I just feel all faithish. But if there is no function, faith is always tied to function. If there is no function based on faith, there is no faith in spite of whatever feeling I have. And when I say function, I'm talking about works because faith without works is dead. So then he says, after you take the shield of faith to fire all the darts that are being shot at you, the weapons, whatever weapons they might be, it's the shield of faith that protects you, that defends you. Then he says, and I love this one, you have to put on the helmet. Hmm. You have to put on the helmet of what? Interesting. That's very interesting that he would say salvation. Now, huh, what does the helmet cover? The head, to be more specific, the brain, the mind. And what does the brain or the mind do? It gives instructions. I can move my arms because my brain tells me to move my arms. I can move my feet because my brain tells me to move my feet. Uh, My brain gives me permission of what I can and cannot do with my bodily expressions. It gives me instruction. So my brain is actively allowing me and instructing me to speak right now. In other words, hear this, just write this down. The brain is your information center, short and sweet. It's your information center. So what is Paul saying to us? If you are going to have victory in your life, and this is a season of unusual victory for all of us, how many want to confess that? How many want to claim that? Then if you are going to win your battles over the enemy's attacks, Paul is saying, that to have victory in your life, then you have to put over your head God-based thinking. The Scripture says we must possess or have the mind of Christ. God wants your identity, your point of reference, because it will control everything else when you have God's view on the matter. The truth is God-based knowledge. That's why you start with the truth. It is how God sees your situation. And how he sees it, I guarantee you, is not how you see it. He is looking down on the problem. You are looking horizontally at the problem. The perspective is quite different. So, the peace is the calm that I live in. But the helmet, the helmet, the helmet is where I receive my instruction in the battle. Important statement. And so God says, get this, you have to look at life through the viewpoint or through the visor of my salvation. In other words, you have to look to get your instructions through the vantage point 
of my saving relationship. I saved you. You were saved. You are saved. You're being saved. Saving you is a continual process. How many of you will admit that you need to be delivered and saved all the time? And so you were saved, you are saved, and you're being saved. And so God says you have to think about the relationship we have where I am always saving you. You have to work out your salvation. You have to see it from a point that a lot of this that's happening is just so I can give you victory. Because there are great rewards with victory. When you win a battle, you understand that all the rewards of the battle belong to you. In other words, when you win a battle, you walk out much better off than you were when you walked in because you take all that the enemy has. Oh, I thought you'd get happy about that. Ah. So that brings me to a question, an important question. As a Christian, do I, Don Mears, think like this? Do I, Don Mears, do this? Do I react this way when I'm in a battle, when I'm in a circumstance, when I'm in a crisis, when I'm in a situation, when I'm in adversity, when I'm in a test, when I'm in a... Is this how I respond? Do I go through this process? Instead of responding to the situation, I need to get God's view on the matter. I need to get some truth of what really is happening. I need to come into divine alignment with the breastplate of righteousness, right standing. I need to know that I'm doing the right thing in the battle because peace, like a river, attendeth my soul. Are you following me? I'm getting instructions of what to do in the battle. And my instructions are always coming from one major understanding. God can save me. God can deliver me out of anything. He's always made a way of escape. I am to be more than a conqueror. I am called to be victorious. Just like Anderson was called to just go from one level to another until I love the third matrix where he's flying and doing all kinds, at least like a, he's like a Marvel character. So the helmet of salvation, that's the helmet of my spiritual relationship with God. It has to become the governing principle of my life. Bottom line, the helmet of salvation, he is the Lord of my life. In everything, I get instructions from him. He's the Lord. I don't say things until I hear him say it. I don't do things until I see him do it. I don't care what the circumstance looks like. I don't care how severe. I don't care what the crisis is. I need to get his perspective and his instructions. Now, here's one that we mostly never really have been taught right. He says you've got to take out the sword of the Spirit. First of all, as you all know, it's the only offensive weapon in all of the arsenal or armor of God that we're to put on. It's the only offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Now, what you probably don't know is if you look up the word in the Greek for sword here, it doesn't mean sword like you think. It means a dagger. You might want to write that down. It's a dagger. Why? Because this is not fighting from any distance. This is close-up battle. All right? It's when the devil is all up in your stuff. This dagger is for close-up fighting. It is not the word for the long sword. It's the word for the short dagger. And the short dagger does you no good unless the person is right in your face. Hello, somebody. 
So it means, literally, the enemy is up in your face. He's trying to destroy your life. He's trying to ruin your life. He's trying to shut you down. He's trying to cause confusion in your mind. He wants you to run away from God. He wants you to fall so you cannot stand. He is all up in your stuff. And you don't know if you're going to make it another day. You are in such a close battle. And God says, look, that's the time that you have to understand. Draw out the sword from its sheath and use it. It's offensive. Kill the sucker. Stab him in his heart. Stab him in his head. Stab him in his eyeballs. Don't just stab him in his foot or leg. I mean, stab him where it will kill him. You got to use the dagger, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, let me break this down for you. There is the Greek word graphy. The graphy is the Greek word for the book. This is the graphy. This is the writings of Scripture. It's only merely the writings that may do absolutely no good at all for other people because they don't see it as God speaking to us. They just see it as a book, a nice book, but whatever. But it is still the Word of God, is it not? Because it is the writings of God. And so this is the graphy. So God's goal is to take the book, the graphy, to become logos. The logos is the meaning of what is written, having the thinking of God understood. So the graphy is the fact that the book was written. The logos is understanding what it meant by what was written. But then the word rhema means to utter or to speak, or to declare it. Please, please write that down. Raymond, Ram, Rama means to utter, to speak, to declare it. In other words, I'm telling you, you can study the Bible till you're blue in the face. You can be able to discuss with your enemy the doctrines. You can be able to understand every truth and still be totally defeated in your battles and not have victory because your dagger is always in its sheath your dagger is not being used he says you have to take the dagger out what good is a dagger if it's stuck down here in the sheath is it for looks so when principalities hear me closely when principalities when powers when darkness and wickedness attack you, and they are up in your face. This is the time that you have to draw out the dagger, which is the Word of God, and use it. And that is the rhema. So the rhema is when you have to speak and declare it. The Bible says life and death is in the tongue. It is when you declare it to be so. Why did I have you say amen three or four times? It means let it be, let it be, let it be. And so you have to declare to the enemy when he's up in your face, you've got to draw out the dagger, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and you have to utter it. You have to declare it. Well, what do you have to declare? You have to do just like Jesus did. It is written. Talking and declaring it to the kingdom of darkness. It is written. That's how you kill the enemy when he's up in your face. The dagger is the word of God, and you say it as a rhema, not as a logos. Well, I believe that the Bible says this, principality. I think this is what the Bible means. No. In the name of Jesus, I declare to you, hell, you're going to have to, I'm going to kill you, sucker, right now. I'm going to pull out the dagger of God's word. I'm going to shout to the rooftops. It is written, and I'm going to declare the word of God, and I'm going to stick you. Not once. I'm going to stick you so many times. There's no possibility you can walk away from this battle. So Jesus is the one who wrote it, the graphy. He's the one who understood it, the logos. And he pulled it out of his sheath when the devil got all up in his face and made rhema come through for the victory. Are you with that? Now, there is a major problem. You're saying yes to everything I'm saying. And I'm trying to make it very simple that these are the armor 
that God's gifted you with. That whether you like it or not, you're in a war. And you are in battles. You can't avoid battles. And if you do not use the armor in the order that it was given, you are going to lose the battle, which means you are not going to walk in victory. Here is the problem. The problem is when you really sit down and listen to a Christian explain their problems, their crisis, their tests, their adversities, they never explain it from a spiritual perspective. They don't see it as a principality attacking them. They don't understand its powers coming against them. They don't see it as darkness or wickedness. They see it as this person is doing this to me. This situation has happened to me. Here's the problem I'm... And they express the problems and the tests and the trials and the circumstances all from a natural, physical, visible level. Why? Because they do not understand that there is a world controlling the world that they live in. And when you sit down and listen, because I've listened to thousands of people, this is how they always choose to talk about their problems. When I counsel married people, do you know what they want? Always. They want me to choose whose side I'm on. And so one of them starts by saying, if she would change and do this, that, and that, we wouldn't have a problem. If she would change, the problem's with her. And then she says, no, the problem is with him. He does this, that, and the other. But if he would change, we wouldn't have a problem. And then they look to me as, whose side, whose report are you going to believe, Pastor. And I look at them and say, you don't understand counseling. I'm not here. I am not here to pick whose side. I am here to show you from this book that when you tell me, and I get into your business, when you tell me what you've done, if you have violated the Scripture, I'm going to come down heavy on you and say, here's what you have to do. Are you willing to do what the Word of God says? And you can't change your spouse. You can only change yourself. Are you willing to accept the responsibility before God to come under the lordship of these words? It is written. And so I'm not on your side. I'm not on your side. I am on God's side. I only speak for what God says. And we're not here just to talk. I will give you homework. And if you don't do the homework, I am not going to see you in next appointment until the homework is done. Do you understand the process? And don't any of you come and try to make counseling appointments. I've done that most of my life. That day and season is over. Like Rhonda, I have resigned. Amen. I'm sorry, Elder Ron, I just, it just came to my mind. I resign from counseling. Mm. Where am I at? Huh. But there is one last weapon in our arsenal. Paul closes chapter 6, verse 18, and he says, With all prayer. Now, this is extremely important because this is a major weapon because you must grasp that prayer is the way that you enter into the supernatural realm. Am I right about that? All right. So prayer is the process. Uh, prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference. Huh. Prayer is you giving heaven permission 
to engage in your earthly scenarios or circumstances or problems predicated based on your willingness to have and to put on the weapons, the armor of God. Just like counseling, if you're not willing to put on the weapons. And so the first thing we have to find is the truth. We've got to know God's perspective of your problem, of your stop looking at it as though it's flesh and blood. That's your problem. When are you going to come to the revelation like Anderson had to come to that there is another world controlling the world that I live in? So a lot of us want prayer without the armor. And God says, no, prayer is the way you engage the armor in the spiritual realm. This is a major key, and so I want to move toward a closing, move toward a closing, move toward a closing, not close, move toward a closing by going to Revelation 12.10. Now, the weapons that we just discussed were to come against principalities, powers, right? Spiritual powers wickedness in high places, darkness. But here, there's something different. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and uh, strength in the kingdom of God, of our God, and the power of His Christ have come. Why? For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. Now, this hasn't happened yet. Satan has not been thrown into the bottomless pit. But it's telling us that Satan himself, the devil, accuses you day and night. In other words, Satan goes before God 24-7. You need to get this in your spirit. Hell is after you. 24 7. Huh. It says day and night. That means a 24 hour cycle. And so hear this. This should wake you up. The enemy is literally plotting against you 24 hours a day. And there are some days we can all testify that Satan must have given the command. All of you, principalities, powers, we attack, get her. And all hell breaks loose in that day. Uh, but even without principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and darkness coming against you, even without that, levels of demonic authority, without that, here we are seeing that Satan himself finds the best way that he chooses to attack you is to accuse you falsely and truthfully before God. How often? Day and night. Satan is a busy little rascal. He seeks to go before God and find a loophole that he can use against you in order to block God from, for, from God coming through his blessings for your life. And so I, I desperately want you to get this. See, you don't get to see this meeting between Satan and God in the courtroom. You don't get to see this activity. It is happening in the spiritual realm constantly. But if you don't believe that it's happening, in the spiritual realm, then you really don't take it seriously. You probably don't even believe that it's taking place because you never speak of it. Again, you are seeing your problem. You are seeing your circumstance. You are seeing your test always from the perspective of physical natural, visible. You see your circumstances always coming down to flesh 
and blood. And God knows, I know a lot of Christians that fight people at the drop of a hat. I'm going to sue you. Had a pastor the other day tell me that he's going to find a lawyer for defamation of character. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Depending on what the circumstances are, I'd rather just forgive him and throw him in God's hands because God is much harder on a person than I would ever be. But my point is, you don't really know or believe or have the revelation in your spirit that this happens 24-7. Satan hates you. He comes to steal from you. He comes to destroy you. And he comes to kill you. And how does he do it? By his mouth making accusations against him. And if you ever take the time to take the name devil and Satan and look them up in the Greek, one means false accuser, the other means true accuser. Now, Satan has wisdom. This is his choice of how he wants to destroy your life. Hmm. 24-7, so that he can bring misery to you, so that he can defeat you, so that he can discourage you, so that he can cause you to lose your stability, so that he can cause you to fall and never get back up. He's trying to cause you to be insecure. He's trying to cause you to be unstable. He's trying to break down things in your life where you will have nervous breakdown where you can simply no longer have any faith and trust in God, you will not be able to stand. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that will not change until he is thrown into the bottomless pit. And whether you want to accept it or not, that is not our reality. Now, my fear is you're going to leave here and get so concerned with what the devil is doing daily, 24-7, that that's all you're going to see. I hope that's not the case because you have the total ability to totally defeat what he's doing. Totally. This is why I took you to Revelation 12. How many ever had a day of pure hell? Only six of you. And the rest of you are identifying with Satan. Lion, just sitting there lying. Okay. Verse 11, put it on the screen, tells us that there are three things related to Jesus. And if you keep these three things always working, it will give you the victory over what Satan is doing, as well as using the armor that God has given you that will give you the victory over principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, host of spiritual wickedness. So the armor is for different levels of demonic powers of authority. But what I'm going to tell you now is three things that give you the victory of how to overcome Satan. So don't miss this. Again, the armor deals with demonic levels of authority, but this that I'm talking about deals with Satan the devil himself. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. How? Don't want to go too fast. They overcame him, meaning Satan, the devil. So you have to know as a Christian how to deal with Satan. You have to know how to battle against Satan. He's only doing one thing against you. He's accusing you. All right? But usually, he's not the one you're trying to overcome. You don't even think. You don't even have thoughts of Satan. Always accusing. That just doesn't run through our mind. We don't see it as an issue or as a problem because we don't really grasp the reality of this. And we don't ever really come to the revelation that we are not wrestling flesh and blood. So it says they overcame Satan, they overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb. Now let me start moving toward a close. On a Friday, Jesus Christ hung between heaven and earth. He is bleeding profusely. 
from his hands, his side, his head, and his feet, and he is losing his blood. As he is shedding his blood, hung between heaven and earth, as he's shedding his blood, he looks up and he says these words, It is finished. And if you don't know what it is finished means, it means it has been paid in full. What was on the layaway plan in the Old Testament got completely paid off at Calvary. At Calvary, hear this, Jesus Christ completely satisfied every demand of God against you. There is nothing that can ever be brought up that has not already been satisfied to God. Even if it's true, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ himself, and he says, excuse me, Father, that has already been paid for. The accusation can't work because I shed my blood on Calvary's tree and there is no accusation that Satan can bring up, whether it's true or false, that has any merit because I paid in full the complete debt. There is nothing. They are in me. They have been created in Christ. There is nothing that he can say against them because of my blood covering them. So Satan keeps wanting to throw up your deficiencies that were satisfied by the payment of Christ. But that just started the weekend, Friday. Let me tell you what happened on Saturday. See, on Saturday, Jesus was just laying in the tomb doing nothing. The Bible says between his death and his resurrection, he went to hell. All right? And when he went to hell, he had two sermons in hell. First of all, he turned to all the demonic levels of authority. He said, listen up, principalities. Listen up, powers. Listen up, demons of spiritual darkness. Listen up, demons of wickedness. You have lost because of what I did on Calvary by the shedding of my blood which means you lose and I win. And then he went over to Satan and he stripped him, literally pulled the keys out of his belt and said, you too lose because of what happened on Calvary. Because if you had understood what was going to happen on Calvary, you would have never killed me. But because the blood of the Lamb that is sinless was shed, every demand that God has for every human being has been satisfied. No longer can your accusations work against anybody, Satan, because of the blood. Because of what I have done in my final layaway plan. Why do I call it layaway? Because sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice was being made throughout the whole Old Testament. Then his second sermon is he goes over to the other side of hell where the saints are in the bosom of Abraham And he says, I want to declare unto you, this is Ramah, I want to tell you that you don't have to stay here any longer because I have satisfied every demand of God. And if you want to go with me, even though you were captive, I am breaking the bonds of your captivity and I'm going to take you. No longer are you on the layaway plan. That plan has been finished. That plan has been completed, and now I'm going to take you into the ramparts of glory where the angels will say, who is coming up here? Who is the Lord of glory? He's the one that's strong and mighty in battle. He is the Lord God of hosts. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he brought them right into the presence of God. Why? Because the layaway plan was over. Then after he finished with Saturday, came Sunday. This is where he chooses to move into a physical, spiritual dimension. Now, we all know that the ladies came to the tomb first and knew that he had arisen. But I particularly like the way that John the Beloved found the tomb, which let John know that Jesus had risen. John basically says, when I came to the tomb, the reason that I knew he had risen is because 
you have to understand, I saw him buried. I saw them put a loin cloth around his body. I saw them put a loin cloth, a towel over his head. But when I walked in the tomb, the loin cloth and the towel over his head were in the same spot, undisturbed, but there was no body. How is it possible, and he not be there, that the position of these cloths have not been disturbed or moved? So John said, the loin cloth was laying in the same space with the same shape and the same location, so I knew that he had to have risen from the grave and go into a glorified body because it did not disturb the physical, and the grave is empty. He has risen. Got to close. Do you know what it means that the grave is empty? From Romans chapter 5, it tells us that it means he not only died to save you, to satisfy the demands of God against you, but to understand the resurrection, you must understand that Jesus now lives to save you. He not only saved you once, he has saved you over and over again because that's what he lives to do. Jesus is right now in heaven looking for opportunities to deliver somebody. He's up in heaven right now looking for opportunities to heal somebody. He's looking for opportunities right now in heaven to cancel all of your debt where you are free from all debt. He is looking to set free somebody. He is looking for opportunities to release you, to say, loose him and let him go. How? By the blood of the Lamb, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. It is always a delivering work from the accusation of the devil. How? By and because of the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is a reality, and if we understand its power, we can say in the blood of the Lamb, I am free. No, nothing you bring to me, Satan, I have to even hear. God will forgive me. The blood has covered me. You have no right to ever bring up my past. I overcome your accusation, Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb. And when you take seriously the position that God has taken concerning the blood of the Lamb, then we move to overcoming Him by the word of our testimony. And the fact is, you can't have a testimony without having a lot of tests. And if you want victory, there's got to be a battle that you win the victory over. And so battles and tests are a part of, the, a part of life. You will never escape them. But God has given us good news. There is no test, trial, adversity, circumstance, or situation that has ever overtaken you that God will not always make a way of escape. And one of the great ways of escape, again, is with your mouth speaking rhema. Let me tell you what God did for me. God healed me, like the lady said today, of this. And the doctors had to confess that I was healed from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Let me testify how God protected me when a car hit me head on and I did not die and that God was with me. Let me tell you how I know that angels are surrounding me and protect me. Let me tell you how I know that God is Jehovah Jireh, that he can provide whenever you are in need. Let me tell you that God is the Rose of Sharon and that God is my shalom. God gives me a peace that surpasses understanding. Let me tell you about my testimony. I'm going to declare it to Satan. Satan, listen up. Listen up, Satan. Listen up. And then lastly, he says, they did not love their lives even to death. <laughs> Sit down. We are talking about a love that has to do with your relationship to God. There's no heavy revelation here. It simply means that you love God more than you love your own life. That's a deep relationship. I close by saying, you know what, church? 
You know what, church? Do you know what, church? Religion won't do that. Religion does not develop relationships. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, you have lost your first love. He says, oh yeah, you got your programs, you got your traditions, but you don't have the relationship. Religion is always performing for God's acceptance. So if I shout more, if I praise more, if I pray more, if I read my Bible more, if I do more works, supposedly I get more from God and I'm in better relationship. If I do work, supposedly I get more. All that's nice, but that's nothing but religion. Why would, why help me? Why would I keep performing religious tasks to get his acceptance when the Bible says that he has already accepted me as the beloved in Christ Jesus. I'm already accepted. He loves me. He loves you. I don't have to work for it. It has been given to me freely by his grace. You don't do stuff to get God's acceptance. Guess what you do? What you do. You do what you do to thank God that he's already accepted you in the beloved. So if you are grateful that he's been with you, if you are grateful that he has seen you through, if you are grateful that he's been faithful to you, if you are grateful that he has been Jehovah Jireh and he's provided for you, if you are grateful that he has angels protecting you and you can send them on assignments, if you are grateful that he is the Lord God that heals thee, if you are grateful that he will deliver you out of any bondage, if you are grateful that you can bind and loose whatever needs to be bound and loose on earth because you declare it in heaven, if you are grateful that God is your God, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is no other beside him, then give God a praise and give him a shout. Hallelujah. Victory, victory, victory shall be ours. It is our season of victory. Can you give God praise? I said, can you give God praise? Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Wow, I like that. I might have to buy that message and listen to it again myself. We are in the season of victory. Let's say the words. Change. Growth. Expansion. Victory. It's amazing. I've taught on all four of those words. I may teach another message on victory. How many would like that? I got to put my helmet of salvation on and see what God says about it. It was quite a revelation to me to grasp that these weapons, this armor, had a pre described order and that you could not take it out of its order because one opened the door for the other. They're predicated on going in order. I don't know if that did anything for you, but that did a whole lot for me. As many times as I've heard this text taught, I said, God, let me, give me the ability to break it down and to make it simple. And so we have victory over powers and authorities of different levels. But we also have victory over Satan, the devil, himself. We have three things that keep working and keep working. If you're falling in love with Jesus, that's one of the things. If you are declaring and confessing your testimony to Satan and to others, that's one of the things. 
And if you know that you know that you know what the blood of the Lamb did for you, it satisfied all of God's demands. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be grateful. Lift up the bread. We bless this bread. This is your body by faith. It's not a symbol. It is your body because that's what you said in your word. This is my body. You didn't make any clarification. And you don't make mistakes because you are the rhema. And you lifted up the cup and you said, this is the new covenant in my blood. The bread takes care of sin, takes care of sickness, takes care of disease. And it takes care of the spirit of poverty that binds many people. The cup of the New Testament has so many promises. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Given it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. According to the measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. Every 50 years, I cancel all debts. But when you came and you preached out of Isaiah, you said, this is now fulfilled, meaning that every day is a day that you can give us debt cancellation. We don't have the time to go through the hundreds of promises. We are created in Christ Jesus. The same spirit that raised you from the dead, that same spirit dwells in me. And I desire that I might know him and the fellowship, the fellowship of his sufferings. In the battle, it causes me to get closer to you, Jesus. It causes me to get closer to you, Spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit. The fellowship of your suffering. But I've got to see it from God's perspective. I don't have to uh, think I'm fighting flesh and blood because that just is not the truth. It is the spiritual world that controls the natural world. And I must come to that revelation. And so I thank you for your body. And I thank you for the new covenant with all of the promises. And God, I especially want to say thank you for adopting me into your family. The the family of royalty. The family of divinity. The family of victory. The family of winning. The family of being more than a conqueror. The family of fulfilling the purpose for which I was brought into this earth. Thank you that I'm in the family. I give you praise and I magnify your holy name. And now in faith, I eat of the bread and I drink of the cup in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. If you've got something to be thankful about, if you've got something you need to tell God of how good he's been, if you've got something you need to speak to with a living rhema, say, hey, hell, I've got something to tell you, hell. I want to declare, it is written. God gave me this scripture on my circumstance. Hell, listen up. It is written. The Lord God is my healer. You have no authority over my body. Listen up, hell. I got news for you. I am more than a conqueror. You can't defeat me because I know how to put on the armor First, the belt of truth. Then the breastplate of righteousness where I come into alignment with the truth. Then I'm going to have peace that surpasses under... Oh, God. I don't want to go through the message again. But all of this is mine. It's mine. Use it. Utilize it. Take out the dagger when he's up in your face and say, stab, 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 stab. 
be a killer. Be a stone-cold killer of demonic powers. Go out and kill somebody. I wish we could kill demons. I don't think we can kill them. But they won't forget they came and battled with you. Got any praise? Got any thanksgiving? Got any exaltation? Ready to magnify? Ready to lift him up? You have not because you ask not. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. Give him your best clap offering, church. Hey, glory. Thank you for watching, family and friends. We would love to hear from you. Please leave a comment on one thing about this message that spoke to you. For more information or to become an online member, visit us at evangelcathedral.net. We'd love to hear from you. If you would like to sow into this ministry, there are three ways you can give. Cash App, Dollar Sign Evangel Cathedral. Text Evangel Cathedral to 77977 or visit evangelcathedral.net and click Give. Prophet, teacher, a pastor.